Hi guys, welcome back. My name is Dr. Samantha and I'm the maternity mentor. And we're here again on a Monday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for one of our live pregnancy question and answer sessions. This is a chance for you guys to ask any questions that you have for me live, as well as a chance for me to answer questions that have been submitted onto our videos um, this week. Um, remember, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for additional content. Please share the channel with your friends and family. Um, and you you know, hit the like and subscribe button. Um, it really helps us out. Um, I'm really excited to interact with you guys. Please, please, please put your comments and your questions into the chat. And we're going to try to help you out as much as we can. I usually go ahead and get started with some of the questions that we have gotten on our videos. And we've gotten some good ones this week. So I'm going to start off with bleeding. I think bleeding is uh, one of the most common questions I tend to get. And it is very scary for a lot of pregnant women to have some bleeding and to try to understand, you know, what's going on. Um, so the first question that I had about bleeding was, I had a question. I'm in my first trimester of pregnancy and I have bleeding with back and abdomen pain. Last night I took a pregnancy test and it was still positive for being pregnant. I had a miscarriage before and I have no kids. What can I do? I'm in England. So this is a great way to start off because it really is extremely hard for parents to have to navigate um, potential miscarriage, which of course starts with bleeding. So bleeding is um, something that is actually potentially very common during the first trimester of pregnancy. There's a lot of reasons why a woman can bleed, but one of the things that's mentioned in this question is back and abdominal pain. And with back and abdominal pain, we really need to take the bleeding seriously. For starters, these could be the signs of an ectopic pregnancy. Ectopic pregnancies are where the fertilized egg, instead of coming down into the uterus and implanting into the uterine wall, instead implants inside the fallopian tube. And this is not good for mom. It's a life-threatening condition for mom. The pregnancy will not survive, unfortunately. But what will happen is as the embryo grows, it will actually explode the fallopian tube preceding that will be bleeding and abdominal and back pain, which is why we need to make sure we're taking um, any bleeding that we see serious. Um, if you have any um, bleeding, you want to contact your healthcare provider immediately or go to the hospital. We want to assess you. The most common way for us to assess you and check what's the source of the bleeding is to do an ultrasound. And this really tells us what the cause of the bleeding is. For starters, it could be a subchorionic hemorrhage, which is a little pool of blood that kind of goes underneath the placenta. And we have a video on that. We can link that into the description. It could also be caused by a variety of infections, which we would want to get treated right away. It could, of course, be caused by um, some placental issues and other things like rough sex. But then, of course, there's also um, miscarriage as a potential cause. Now, many women who've had a miscarriage before and then start to have complications with a subsequent pregnancy often ask, what can I do? What are the things that I can do to prevent miscarriage? And we, we have a video that references some, but the biggest thing is, is that you need to try to stay healthy. Um, your body needs to be in optimal health to help prevent a miscarriage to the best of your ability. So making sure you're drinking plenty of water and making sure that you're eating right, making sure you're getting plenty of sleep. Sleep is one of the number one most essential things to your health. A lot of people take this for granted. Also, a lot of people are afraid to take medications for sleep. We associate sleep medications with sleeping pills. And these oftentimes have a very negative connotation. But there's a lot of natural remedies that you can do to improve your sleep. And frankly, as a provider who prescribes sleeping pills, it would be far better for many women to take very safe sleeping pills like uh, Unisom, if it's approved by your healthcare provider, versus not sleeping. 
Um, not sleeping causes a cortisol stress reaction in your body that can actually make it harder for you to get pregnant. Um, if you are having issues with miscarriage, you also want to have your doctor do a full workup, a completely full workup to make sure there's nothing else going on with you medically. There's a lot of things like thyroid issues and vitamin deficiencies that can be an issue. But what a lot of people don't realize also is there's some genetic issues like MTHFR genetic mutation or anemia or even autoimmune disorders that can make it harder for you to get pregnant. So it's important to rule out medical causes. Um, and then finally, you, you just want to make sure that you're trying to put yourself into the best headspace possible. When you've had repeated miscarriages, it's extremely stressful. This is not something you can just put out of your mind. And I do realize that. But as much of a Zen feeling as you can possibly achieve is extremely important. Um, so now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to answer the question that we have in the chat from Navjot. I hope I'm saying that right. How can I work out with my after delivery tummy? I get so much hungry most of the time. I eat a lot. Before pregnancy, my weight was 67 and now it's 80. I suspect that's kilograms. Okay. So it depends on a couple things. For starters, it depends on whether you had a vaginal birth or a cesarean birth. And whichever one you had, generally speaking, you need to wait six weeks unless your healthcare provider has told you something different. So a lot of women will start to feel back to normal very quickly, especially after a vaginal delivery. Well, what you got to understand is your body is going through massive changes to recover. When we're pregnant, our entire body shifts. It's not just that we grow a belly with a baby inside of it, okay? Our cardiovascular system, that's your blood and your heart, completely changes. When you're pregnant, you have extra blood volume. Your blood pressure is usually higher. Your pulse rate is usually higher. So all of that has to get back to normal. Um, you also have um, changes to your lungs, um, your lung capacity grows during pregnancy. Your immune system is weakened during pregnancy. Um, the hormone relaxin, which is needed to relax all the joints to allow the pelvis to widen for a delivery, it, it, it's still there and these joints are loose and, and everything needs to go back to normal. So you need at least six weeks post-recovery or post-delivery to recover your body. Once that happens, for most women, you can go back to a lot of your regular exercises. Now, some of them want to start out slow. So they want to go walk first before they jog or something like that. That is totally fine. But you can go ahead and you can start walking at a regular rate. Now, as far as your actual stomach go, a lot of women get really upset about the stomach itself because it's very loose. Um, you can do some strength training and some weight training. That can sometimes help but sometimes it's, it's going to take a little bit of time for you to reshape your body. I also encourage people to try the keto diet. We have a keto video that I'll link into the description. Keto is high healthy proteins, high healthy fats, and lower carbs, which are sugars. When you eat a high protein diet, it's actually going to help keep you from being hungry all the time because protein fills us up faster. The other thing is when you eat a lot of protein and not a lot of sugar, your body's going to go into a state of ketosis where it's basically breaking down fat to use as sugar. And when it does that, you'll lose weight that way. And keto can be safe for pregnancy and for postpartum. So I would suggest that you look into the keto diet because that may actually make you feel fuller, less hungry, and help you lose weight. Now, forceps delivery. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry to hear that. So one of the things I'm going to tell you is you need to look into pelvic floor therapy. Um, so a forceps delivery is the use of forceps to help kind of pull the baby out when the baby gets stuck during a vaginal delivery. It can be extremely traumatic and um, for both mom and baby and can cause a lot of vaginal and pelvic floor injury. When your pelvic floor muscles... These are the muscles that line the vagina and the rectum. When they're weakened or damaged during delivery, this can actually affect your ability to get back to working out the way you want to. So you actually need to make sure that you're seeing a pelvic floor therapist 
to do a full assessment, make sure you've healed properly and make sure that you're strong enough to do certain weight bearing exercises. Um, pelvic floor therapy is one of the most essential things a woman can do for her overall health. During some of these deliveries, again, so you have the vaginal floor, which is full of these muscles. And if you put your fingers inside your vagina and you were to kind of do a Kegel where you clench those muscles, those are the muscles that I'm talking about. Those are pelvic floor muscles, amongst other things. If any of those have been torn or damaged and you don't give them the proper time to heal and you start, say, exercising the wrong way, you can actually do more harm than good, including possibly ending up doing exactly what Navdot just put into the um, chat. I pee a lot. My bladder is weak. And when I laugh or sneeze, I get pee. Yep. Yep. That was exactly what I was going to say. When the pelvic floor muscles are damaged or they're not strong, especially after a traumatic birth, you can end up um, peeing, having urinary incontinence. Um, and if we don't get that fixed, this could be permanent. I think we have a video on urinary incontinence. We'll try to link into the into the chat. But the biggest treatment for that is actually um, pelvic floor therapy. So you want to go ahead and start looking into that. And I would absolutely 100% tell you, do not do any heavy exercises until you've had a pelvic floor evaluation. You want to let them tell you what's safe for your condition because um, your pelvic floor health is essential for lifelong, um, lifelong good health. Um, that was a great question. Um, I'm going to go back. Please feel free to anybody who's joining us to put any questions that you have into the chat. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to keep answering some of the questions that we've gotten um, on to the, the videos this week. Um, we had a question that said, I'm less than one month pre pregnant and I'm bleeding. I took a pregnancy scan and there was nothing seen in the scan. Sorry, but nothing was seen in the scan result. I took another pregnancy test and it was still positive. Okay. So this is a mom who's been bleeding. She is one month pregnant, more or less. When they did an ultrasound, they couldn't see anything on the ultrasound, but she's still testing positive for being pregnant. So this is one of those things that oftentimes gets women really nervous. They're really scared about this. They're just wondering, what am I supposed to do with this? So here's what you guys need to understand. When you are pregnant, there is a hormone called human chorionic gonadotropin, HCG. And HCG is a hormone that we find in the blood and in the urine. So when you're taking a home pregnancy test where you pee on the stick, that's what it's testing for. Now, that test is just simply looking for presence. It doesn't tell us how much is there. When we test blood, we actually get a number. And if your pregnancy is going well, your number is going to rise, okay? So it's going to keep going up. Now, what when we suspect a miscarriage, one of the things that we will sometimes do is a serial serum HCG. That means we take your blood today, we check the number, and a couple of days later, you come back and we check again. If the number is going up, the pregnancy is probably okay, even if we don't see anything on ultrasound. Um, ultrasound is not perfect, and very, very early on, sometimes we won't see anything. However, if the HCG number is going down, that means that most likely, unfortunately, you're having a miscarriage. Now, this confuses a lot of people because sometimes that means the baby has also passed. So they wonder why they're still getting positive pregnancy tests. This can happen simply because the HCG level hasn't gone back to normal yet, which is why you'll still pee out HCG. Or it could be because you have retained pieces of pl of placenta or other products from the pregnancy that are tricking your body into thinking it's still pregnant. So this is why it's so essential to make sure you're following up with your healthcare provider. So Navjot, can I try for a second baby if my situation is like that? So absolutely Navjot. I would take a look at the video on incontinence because there are surgical options if pelvic floor therapy 
was not successful. But pelvic floor therapy nowadays is very successful at treating some of that incontinence and stuff like that. So you can absolutely have another baby, even if it's not successful, and then you might opt for some of the surgical treatments. However, what I would tell you is that you do want to practice baby spacing. So what a lot of women don't realize is it is actually not recommended to get pregnant before your child is two years old. It's baby spacing. And it's recommended by the WHO for women across the world, whether you're in a um, in, in any country, no matter what your economic situation is. So baby spacing allows the body to heal properly. Um, there's a lot of stuff, you know, we say six weeks before you can start doing stuff again. That's just because that's kind of what our society is like. We're go, 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 go. But it took you 10 months to make a baby. It takes at least 10 months for you to recover. In an ideal world, you're breastfeeding for a year. If you breastfeed for one year, you really shouldn't be getting pregnant during that time because pregnancy could interfere with your milk supply. So there, there's already your year of recovery. Another year is designed to make sure that your body is completely healthy before going through another pregnancy, because that pregnancy is going to have a heavy uterus and a heavy baby pushing down on those pelvic floor muscles, okay? If you take the time to heal your pelvic floor, you might not only um, fix that problem permanently, but you might end up having a better delivery than with your, your first baby. So I would definitely encourage you to wait at least two years before trying for a second baby. Hi, Jess. I, I heard you mention keto diet. Would that be a good idea for postpartum weight loss while keeping a robust milk supply? So yes, you can absolutely do keto while keeping a robust milk supply. Um, one of the things, and we did link it into the description, for any of you guys considering keto, I do not recommend traditional keto. If you guys start going down the keto rabbit hole, you're going to see a diet where you're supposed to count macros and calculate sugars and all this other stuff. I think that that's way too complicated for most people with a very busy life. So instead, what you're going to do is you're going to focus on keto friendly foods. You can go online, you can just type in keto foods, and you'll get lists of foods that are considered keto friendly. From there, you take those foods and you eat in moderation, knowing that the diet looks to be about 60% healthy proteins, approximately 30% um, healthy fats, and approximately 10% carbohydrates being keto-friendly carbohydrates. Um, and if you think and if you look at some of the foods that are on these keto lists, they're extremely healthy, and it makes sense that they would absolutely encourage a milk supply. For starters, you've got basically all of the meats with a focus definitely on red meats. You have a lot of the cheeses, okay? You have a lot of dairy. And then, of course, you have um, a lot of the really healthy vegetables and fruits. You've got the ground berries, which are high in antioxidants. You've got a lot of the... Um, You've got a lot of the, um, oh my gosh, the green vegetables, sorry. So you've got your broccolis and your your all your different leafy greens like spinach and stuff. One of the things I would tell you is if you eat an alternative diet to begin with, meaning you're a vegetarian or you're vegan, et cetera, you really have to look at the diet carefully to make sure you're going to get the balanced amount of nutrients, okay? One of the things that we also don't really realize with making breast milk, there's all this stuff about making a robust milk supply and how diet's so important and you have to eat an extra 500 calories. That really isn't necessarily the case. Our bodies are designed to do this really well. The bigger things that we have to worry about is, for example, staying hydrated, we also want to make sure we're not using any herbs that might dry out a milk supply. So these are some of the things that are actually more important. One of the things you can also do is look at some of the herbal supplements that can help encourage your milk supply. And then just for any breastfeeding woman who's starting, listen, dirty keto is pretty easy to do. Start it for a couple days. 
and keep an eye on your breast milk supply. I mean, it's going to be pretty obvious pretty quick if anything's tanking. As long as you're keeping a close eye, one day of a d diminished milk supply is not going to be the end of the world. And don't start keto, ladies, this week until after Thanksgiving because this is not the time to start a new diet uh, if you're in this country. Obapa, I hope I'm saying that right. Please, as a first-time mom-to-be, what should I do when I found out I am pregnant? What is the appropriate time or weeks that I should get my first ultrasound scan, scan sorry, after an embryo transfer? Okay, so this is good questions. And I actually would have two different answers kind of based on the two different questions. So I'm going to go with your second question first. When I hear the words embryo transfer, for anybody who doesn't know what that means, that means that's a fertilized egg that's been fertilized outside of the body and has multiplied to become an embryo and is now going to be transplanted back into the woman. That is IVF, intro, uh, in vitro fertilization. If you are doing an embryo transfer, I don't recommend anything, they are absolutely telling you when they want ultrasounds and how they want to do it. So anybody who's going through IVF has had some kind of issues getting pregnant. We commonly use the word infertility. That's not always the case. There's a variety of reasons why people choose um, in vitro fertilization. The people that are doing that embryo transfer usually have a protocol. When you pick them, you pick them probably because you like um, their model of care, you probably looked into their statistics, stuff like that. They, all that data is based off of how they do things. And so you would want to follow their plan and you can't give a blanket statement on when to do an ultrasound because it might mess up their, you know, the way they do things. So for IVF, I'd be following the IVF doctor 100%. I just wouldn't even question their plan. For a mom who's getting pregnant naturally, um, usually we recommend an ultrasound around eight weeks to confirm a pregnancy at your first um, appointment unless you're having a complication. Before eight weeks, one of the things that you guys got to understand is that ultrasound, yes, the technology's come a long way. Everything's a lot more modernized. But really, ultrasound is not perfect. It is by far not a perfect science. And we can miss babies less than eight weeks pregnant. And so sometimes this will create a sense of anxiety and different things that can really, really, really upset a mom and then makes everything harder. So usually we try to wait until eight weeks or later to do our first ultrasound because we're much more likely to um, see a baby. Now, the other thing is, for those of you guys who don't know this, now they will oftentimes do a vaginal ultrasound. And vaginal ultrasounds are much more accurate, but they can be off-putting if you don't know what they are. So a vaginal ultrasound is where they have a long ultrasound wand. It kind of just looks like a long, um, thick, like a handle, like a handle of your hairbrush or something like that. It's round. And what they do is they put basically what looks like a condom over that wand, okay? Then what they're going to do is they're going to put some jelly on it, and they're going to ask you to insert that into your vagina. Once it's inserted, they're going to ask to move it ever so slightly in different positions to get images of the uterus. Part of the reason why this works is because you're, they are closer to where they're trying to get pictures and they're not going through abdominal fat to do it. The other thing is, is that um, we're able to kind of manipulate the cervix and move the cervix out of the way when we do it. Now, that being said, it's kind of uncomfortable. And so you guys should be aware that this is not um, something that's often is as easy as it sounds for a lot of women, and it can cause some bleeding. So, you know, it's one of the things to take into account, but I would definitely encourage you, some women will refuse a vaginal um, ultrasound because it just makes them uncomfortable, um, even just uncomfortable with the idea of somebody inserting something into the vagina, but it really is the most accurate way to look at the baby. Jess, what herbs can dry out a milk supply? 
So it's hard to say everybody's different as to what herbs to avoid. I will tell you one of the number one things that I find that dries out milk supply that goes under the radar is peppermint. So many of you guys may not realize this, but peppermint, it, if you eat the real peppermint candies, that can actually dry out your milk supply. I'm talking like Altoids and stuff. A lot of people don't realize that. I actually had a mom recently who was using peppermint oil deodorant and her, um, her, like her milk supply was tanking and we couldn't figure out why we were like trying to go through all these different, um, all these different like scenarios. And we just weren't finding the answer and we were doing everything we were supposed to do to get the milk supply up. And it just, it wasn't really taking hold. And lo and behold, it turned out that she had used a natural deodorant, um, peppermint oil deodorant. So you want to make sure that you're avoiding that. I tend to tell women to avoid all essential oils. Um, the thing is essential oils, um, if they're absorbed into the skin can have a variety of, um, effects on a woman's, um, milk supply. Um, that other thing that I want to tell you, um, is that you want to avoid herbal teas that are specialty. Like, so what I mean is like, like organic, um, mom and pop herbal teas, you know, we see like chamomile, we'll see sleepy time, we'll see all this stuff. Don't use them. Okay. None of the teas are FDA regulated. So that means nobody's going in to see what ingredients they're being used. Are their supply lines being like their manufacturing lines being cleaned? Nothing. You have no idea what's in there and they may not know what herbs are in there. And so as a result, there may be herbs in there that could dry out your milk supply. Um, what was another one? Oregano can dry out your milk supply. Um, black walnut, peppermint, parsley, spearmint. Um, so there's a lot. Parsley, um, if you drink like a parsley tea or you put a parsley paste on your breast, that can um, interfere with your milk supply. So the thing is, is that these... Um, herbal teas, they may have those ingredients and you do not know that. For moms that are breastfeeding, I tell them to avoid herbal teas altogether. Um, mother's milk tea might be the exception because it's been used by a lot of women to help increase milk supply. So there's kind of, it seems like that is the one exception. But if you're just drinking tea to drink tea, I would avoid it. For those of you who are joining us, I'm Dr. Samantha, the maternity mentor. Um, we're here for another one of our live Q and A's. Please put your questions into the chat. Like many of our, um, listeners, viewers have been doing so far and I will answer them for you. Um, I had a question about using antibiotics. So I am nine days post intrauterine insemination. After three days of my IUI, which is intrauterine insemination, I got acute sinusitis, which is a sinus infection. So the doctor prescribed clarith clarithromycin, 500 milligrams twice a day. I am very worried. Will it cause any harm to my baby if I conceived in this cycle? So the answer is clarithromycin is considered a risk versus, I'm sorry, a benefits versus risk antibiotic. There is no evidence to say that this antibiotic has been associated with any types of birth defects of any kind. Um, it seems to be safe and it seems to be effective. Well, so you should be able to use it. There are antibiotics that have a safer profile, meaning we've used them more and we know that there's data that shows that there are probably no birth defects versus clarithromycin, which is not commonly used. So I would have been asking your healthcare provider if there are any other options that you can use. But the other thing I want to tell you is sinusitis. So it's inflammation of the sinuses. That does not necessarily equate to a bacterial infection requiring antibiotics. Antibiotics kill bacteria. They do not kill viruses, and a lot of sinusitis is caused by viruses. When we're pregnant, we need to make sure that we are treating bacterial infections. They can have serious consequences, including miscarriage, stillbirth, and preterm labor. 
But we also don't want to take medications unnecessarily. And unfortunately, sinusitis is often viral in nature, which means no antibiotic is going to help. And if it can be avoided, it should. So I would encourage you to really talk to your healthcare provider and determine is um, an antibiotic really necessary at this time. But it can be used if it's needed. Um, I had a couple questions about depression during pregnancy, specifically some medication stuff. So I am a very big advocate on women receiving medication during pregnancy and postpartum if they need it. Um, I think that we're really starting to understand now how important it is to treat, um, you know, any type of depression, anxiety, PTSD, OCD, all these other things. Because if left untreated, they cause cortisol and stress responses in the body, which can be devastating. And that doesn't count the impact that it has on a woman's life. So the first question was about paroxetine. Is paroxetine safe during pregnancy? So for those of you who aren't familiar with this medication, this is um, Paxil, paroxetine, okay? So paroxetine is an SSRI, serotonin selective reuptake inhibitor. Basically means I'm increasing serotonin in your brain. It's a neurotransmitter that helps with depression and anxiety. Paroxetine is not safe during pregnancy, but I do want to clarify. So over the years, we have used a variety of these SSRIs in women who are pregnant and breastfeeding. And what we found is that they tend to be pretty safe. There are some considerations that we make need to take into account. But as far as like birth defects and different things, these don't exist. Um, babies seem to tolerate them pretty well when they're breastfeeding. And overall, it's a really good option for moms who are struggling with depression and anxiety. Paxil is the one exception. So what happened with Paxil is years ago, um, there was a study. And that study associated Paxil with cardiovascular birth defects, heart defects, including um, something called a VSD, which is a ventral septal defect. It's basically a hole in the heart. And so um, as soon as that was discovered, Paxil was listed as a no-go, unsafe for use during pregnancy, and everybody was told to not use it. Now, what's ended up happening is that study has been re-reviewed over the years, and they found a lot of flaws with it. And now the data is not very clear if Paxil actually does that. However, the thing is, once it was, we were all told not to use Paxil, everybody stopped using Paxil, which makes sense. So Paxil is very, it's very possible that it does not cause this. However, it should be used with extreme caution. And it is recommended to use Paxil if that is the only medication that will help a mom and all other medications have been tried. So this is something that requires a discussion with your healthcare provider. The next one I got was, is catiapine safe during pregnancy, which is Seroquel. So Seroquel is one of my favorite meds of all time. I love Seroquel. Everybody gets really, really scared with Seroquel um, because of what I'm about to tell you. So Seroquel is an antipsychotic. And that sounds terrifying. Antipsychotics do treat psychosis. So they treat psychosis, they treat schizophrenia, and they can treat bipolar disease. What people don't realize is a lot of antipsychotics will also help with depression and anxiety, and they can help with insomnia. Seroquel happens to be one of my favorites because this antipsychotic has a wide range of dosing. You can go from 12.5 milligrams to like 900 milligrams a day. It's safe for pregnancy and it's safe for breastfeeding. So it's really a great drug. I oftentimes use it for my, my moms who are having trouble with sleep because sleep is so essential for your mental health. And it's just light enough in some cases to allow you to sleep, but still to be able to function the next day, which the biggest thing with Seroquel is the next day, a lot of women can report sleepiness. So we have to take that into account. As far as being pregnant on Seroquel, the biggest risks are not about birth defects or any issues with the baby. It's with mom. So all the antipsychotics, unfortunately, have a risk of raising your blood pressure, causing weight gain, and causing an increase in blood sugar. So there has been some evidence to show that Seroquel taken during pregnancy can increase weight gain and can cause diabetes mellitus. 
It can also cause you to have an LGA baby, which is a large for gestational age baby. And when your baby is too big, this can actually um, potentially interfere with you having a vaginal birth. So this is why we do want to be careful when using Seroquel, but it is very much a valid option and something that we really like. I really like particularly. Uh, Obapa, is it normal to not to feel any pregnancy symptoms after testing positive of 845 HCG blood test? And when will I feel symptoms? Okay. It is very normal not to feel symptoms. Some women don't feel symptoms even if their HCG levels are through the roof. So that can be normal. It just depends on the mom, okay? We have a video on like early signs of um, pregnancy, but really every mom is different and the HCG does not always correlate with having symptoms. Um, when will you feel any symptoms? Again, it's hard to say. It's not really related to HCG necessarily. It's more related to um, it's more related to you and how you tolerate some of the changes. Um, I will say that depending on how far along you are or when your embryo transfer was, you know that 845 does seem a little low. So you want to make sure you're following up on that level and having them repeat it. Um, all right. So I got this great question and we're going to go into it. So I love talking about um, sex and pregnancy. I have a great video on it. I talk about sex a lot in my office. I think that sexual health is extremely important for human beings and their mental health. And I firmly believe that this is something that we should talk about openly for pregnant and postpartum um, people. So I got a question that was based off of um, my uh, video on preventing vaginal tearing during labor. And the question was, can you give examples on how to become sexually aroused during labor to prevent tearing? Do you think um, do you just think about it? And is it weird to do this in a hospital room filled with people? So to give context, there's something called um, an orgasmic birth. Um, this is a concept that's been studied. When we have an orgasm, we're releasing the hormone oxytocin. Oxytocin is the love hormone. It's a hormone designed to help create bonding. It helps with an orgasm. And it helps actually to produce contractions in labor. And overall, it makes us feel really good. So we're, we're releasing endorphins and stuff when we have an orgasm. It really is a very, very healthy and kind of soothing feeling for most human beings. So there was a lot of study about how this might help during birth and to help with pain relief. And what we found is that sexual, um, sexual arousal during birth can help actually with pain as well. Now, the reason why it helps prevent tearing is that when you are aroused, a lot of blood flows to those tissues, as well as some other hormones that kind of help everything loosen up, okay? Because when we are, we are engaged in sexual activity, generally speaking, part of that's going to involve some kind of penetration of the vagina, and that usually needs to involve a little bit of stretching. So this helps, these hormones and this blood flow help to like stretch out and loosen up the vagina, which is of course what we want to prevent um, tearing. Now, is it something, is it, is it weird um, to do in front of people? I would say that's up to you. Um, it depends on how you could even go about um, becoming sexually aroused, to be very honest. If you're a visual person and you can kind of visualize in your mind and you can kind of get into that headspace, you could probably use it in conjunction with hypnobirthing, where you're kind of like getting into a meditative state and you happen to be kind of more meditating in the sexual arena. Um, could you do something more than that? Absolutely. When you stimulate the clitoris, you're going to, for most people, stimulate some sexual arousal and that could help produce it. Now, to be very honest, depending on how far along you are into your labor and what is going on, you can ask people to leave your room. You are allowed to have privacy unless there is an emergency. You don't have to explain why. You can just ask people to do that. 
if you and your partner have a very good relationship, you can explain to your partner what you're doing. Um, but to be honest, in most birthing centers and hospitals, you, you, somebody isn't sitting in the room with you at all times until you're getting ready to deliver. The one thing I will tell you is that it is hard sometimes to get sexually aroused from external stimulation if you have had an epidural. Epidurals are designed to kind of mute the sensations down in the lower body. So that may be difficult, which means you probably would want to practice um, a mindset version of this if possible. Um, the other thing is, if, you're, if your water has broken, if your amniotic sac has broken, you're now at higher risk for infection. So if you felt like you needed any kind of external um, stimulation, basically clitoral stimulation only, you need to make sure your hands have been washed, okay? You wash your hands very well. Um, and make sure you don't use hand sanitizer and you wash your hands because hand sanitizer applied to a clitoris, even if it's dried on your hand, is going to hurt, okay? That is not going to be fun. Um, the other thing um, that you want to do is no, nothing. I don't care what's going on. Nothing in the vagina. Nothing, nothing, nothing. When you are in active labor, you need to keep that as clean as possible because a lot of other people have to go in there to check you. So nothing in the vagina. And that's kind of how you do it. Um, it's not going to work for everybody. There is a book on that orgasmic um birth. It is very controversial, but there's more and more evidence showing that it actually can help. Um, embryo transfer is three weeks. Yeah. So three weeks, that sounds like a, a approximately right HCG level. I just seemed low if it had been longer than that. So that actually seems right. Um, okay. I have a question um, about vitamin D deficiency and the baby. So can I add one milliliter of vitamin D to my formula for my newborn baby? So for any of you guys who don't know, if you are breastfeeding only, you need to make sure your baby is getting vitamin D. You need to give vitamin D supplementation. You always want to talk to your, um, to your, a pediatrician to get the proper dosing, but it is recommended for all breastfeeding only babies to do external vitamin D supplementation. The breast milk just doesn't have enough vitamin D in it. However, most pediatricians are now recommending that you do vitamin D supplementation for babies who are using formula. So vitamin D is one of the most essential vitamins that you will ever take in your life. We used to associate it just with like bone health. Okay, that's what everybody say. Oh, it helps you absorb calcium and that makes your bones stronger. It That's like irrelevant almost now. I mean, it does do that and it's very important, but most people don't even talk about that anymore. Vitamin D deficiency, if left untreated, can lead to depression, anxiety, memory issues, mood, uh, concentration, brain fog, um, it can lead to depression, anxiety, panic attacks. It's like crazy. It's one of the most powerful um, precursors to some of our neurotransmitters. So one of the things that I test for a lot of people is vitamin D. And if they're vitamin D deficient, I make sure that we start supplementing right away. So babies, in my opinion, should be supplemented. However, vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin. So we have water-soluble and fat-soluble. Water-soluble vitamins, if we don't need it in our body, we pee it out. So if you take 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C and you needed one milligram, you're going to pee out 999 milligrams. That's how it works. It's plain and simple. We do not hold on to any water-soluble vitamins we don't need. Fat-soluble vitamins are stored into our fat. So if you are taking a fat-soluble vitamin, and you need, um, and you don't need it, you're going to store it into your fat. And over time, that could become toxic. And vitamin D toxicity is serious. It is not something to be messed with. And that is especially the case for babies. Most formula does have some vitamin D in it. And then in the question, she references one milliliter. Well, I don't know how many international units are in one milliliter, which is very important for all of you guys to consider. So what is my answer? 
absolutely not. You cannot do that. You need to go to the pediatrician and ask the pediatrician to tell you how much to give your baby because it will be based on the baby's weight, the baby's feeding type, and the baby's age. Okay. But absolutely, once you get that guideline, you should go ahead and do that. For those of you who are joining me, please feel free to put any of your questions into the chat. Um, right now, in between, I'm answering questions that came in on some of the videos. Um, I had a question about bed rest. It says, I'm on bed rest now. Can I sit on the toilet bowl? So this is extremely important um, for any of you guys who've been recommended for bed rest. Please, please, please make sure you watch my video on that. And please ask the questions that are in there. So bed rest looks a million different ways a million different women depending on what their issue is. So let me give you an example. Placenta previa. Placenta previa is where, okay, so you have a uterus. At the bottom of the uterus is the cervix, okay? Sometimes the placenta, instead of attaching on the side of the uterine wall, it, atta it attaches so it's right over the cervix, okay? This is a complete placenta previa. And this is dangerous because at some point in time when your cervix opens up to dilate, this whole side is covered with blood vessels. Once this opens, it becomes a hemorrhage and both mom and baby can die. It's a medical emergency. So we have to monitor those patients very carefully. Now, that mom is most likely going to be delivered around 34 weeks. We don't like for her to go into labor because, again, if she dilates even a centimeter, that can be a medical emergency. Leading up to this, we want to keep her pregnant as much as possible. So she might be put on bed rest. So what does bed rest look for like for this mom? Well, potentially for her, it means no heavy lifting. Um, you need to stay off of your feet like most of the time. Yes, you can cook dinner. No, you can't walk around the store. You need to use one of those wheelchair things. Um, yes, you can take a shower. Yes, you can use the bathroom, right? So that is a form of bed rest. Now, another scenario. We have a mom who has a repeated history, a, a history of repeated miscarriages. She has a history of incompetent cervix and she has a cerclage. For those of you who don't know what a cerclage is, it's a stitch that tries to keep the cervix closed. Her cervix is shortening, so we want a cervix to be long, thick, and closed, okay? But her cervix is shortening, which means instead of being long, it's short. It's very tiny, okay? So her cervix is trying to dilate against that stitch. She's been spotting, and so we're trying to keep her pregnant because she's only 20 weeks pregnant, okay? So instead of being 40, she is 20 weeks pregnant. That is a mom whose bed rest probably looks very different. This is a mom who probably is on bed rest 23 out of 24 hours a day. This is a mom who might not be able to use the toilet. She might have to use what's called a bedside commode, which is like a portable toilet that literally sits right next to the bed. So all she has to do is get up, go to the bed, and come back. This is a mom who probably has to take stool softeners because she's not allowed to push to go poop. Because if she pushes, she might actually tear open her cervix. So she might dilate open her cervix, okay? Um, this is a mom who's probably not allowed to shower. If she is allowed to shower, she's probably only able to shower every three days for a max total of 10 minutes. And that 10 minutes includes getting undressed and drying off, okay? So these are two radically different examples of bed rest. This is why you need to, unfortunately, ask your healthcare provider if you're allowed to use the toilet. And what does that mean? Because some women are allowed to use the toilet for both peeing and pooping, and some women are only allowed to use the toilet for peeing, or they're only allowed to use the toilet for pooping, that being the more common. A lot of women are told they have to pee on a bedpan and they can poop in the toilet. So I can't really answer that question, but instead I liked it because it's an opportunity for me to tell you guys what you should be looking for and what you should be asking if you are told you're on bed rest. 
Um, is it okay to drink cranberry and pomegranate juice in your first trimester? And what others can you recommend? So, um, I hate juice. So I'm not sure why you'd want to drink juice. So I would be saying no. Now, why do I say no? Real pomegranate juice, just so you guys know, does actually have a lot of good stuff, has a lot of good antioxidants and different things that are actually really healthy for us. Cranberry juice is good to uh, cause the urine to be acidic, which can help to prevent uh, urinary tract infections. To be clear, I have a um, video on urinary tract infections that we'll link into the description. It's very important to be mindful of urinary tract infections because they are one of the biggest risks to miscarriage and preterm birth. But cranberry juice does not treat them. They can only potentially help to prevent them. Uh, cranberry juice, definitely, if you were to drink it, it needs to be real cranberry juice. The real deal, like not from a concentrate cranberry juice, okay? Which is usually actually pretty bad tasting. So why don't I recommend those two juices? And frankly, why don't I recommend any juice? Because it's sugar, okay? Sugar is not good for us, okay? We are at high risk when we are pregnant for developing diabetes. It's just the name of the game. Your entire system is just out of whack between the hormones, between the change of metabolism, your immune system tanking, all the different changes that allow for the pregnancy to take place also make it harder for us to do stuff like metabolize our food. And so drinking these juices, which are very high in sugar, even if it's natural sugar, is just not cool. What I would be telling you is if you wanted the benefits of cranberry or pomegranate or orange juice or mango juice or whatever juice you guys are thinking, eat the fruit. The fruit is far better for you. You've got fiber in that fruit, which is going to go ahead and help counteract um, the sugar, the carbohydrates that are there. And again, I would check out the keto video. I don't want you guys going too much into it, but you can take fiber away from sugar to actually calculate a lower sugar content because of how you digest it. So the other thing is the juicing process is extremely taxing on most fruits and you lose a lot of nutrients. They'll tell you there's nutrients in there, but they really aren't there, not to the extent we want them to be. Finally, the one thing you guys should know it's very common nowadays for us to see smoothie bars and juice bars and all these other things, which are great, except when you're pregnant. A lot of those you have to be careful because some of those fresh squeezed juices can actually contain bacteria that may be harmful for the pregnancy. So you want to be careful. And, and they usually don't recommend that you get fresh squeezed juices from stores. If you want to squeeze your own juice yourself, that may be okay, but not from other places. Um, I got a question on sickle cell disease um, that actually I'm not going to do that one yet. I got a question on miscarriage. So how do you know if you have any of the symptoms that are listed in the video? I've had two successful pregnancies and then two miscarriages back to back. And I'm worried to try again. Um, both of those were at six weeks and my healthcare provider couldn't give me as to why he did so many tests. So this question um, I thought was a very telling question because when a mom has um, repeated miscarriages, she gets really nervous. She wants to know what the cause is. That's a very big thing. And so we run a whole bunch of tests to try to help. And sometimes we can and sometimes we can't. Um, the things you need to be aware of is that sometimes the cause of the miscarriage occurred before you ever got pregnant. What do I mean by that? So infection is a very common cause. That's why I tell you guys, if you see any kind of discharge, you need to go get it checked out. If you see any kind of bleeding, you need to go get it checked out. If you have a urinary tract infection and they offer you an antibiotic and you decide to take it, you need to take all of it as prescribed. If you're told you have a yeast infection, you need to take the yeast infection medication as prescribed. Everything needs to be done as prescribed. Some women will come to me and they will tell me that they were having urinary tract infections a couple weeks before every miscarriage they had. 
Urinary tract infections um, oftentimes will leave bacteria around the vaginal rim, and that bacteria can inch up into the uterus and cause a uterine infection that's subclinical. That means you don't really have any symptoms. But then a pregnancy comes along, and it's very hard for the pregnancy to maintain itself because the vaginal lining is irritated. That's one potential cause. There's something called MTHFR, genetic mutation. MTHFR is a mutation that causes you to not be able to absorb folic acid like everybody else. The way I try to describe it is this. Um, for people who normally can process folic acid, you have a soft serve ice cream cone and the soft serve ice cream is the folic acid. But that folic acid has a hard outer layer to protect itself, okay? Because it doesn't want you to eat it. But that chocolate shell, that outer layer, you're just going to chomp right through it because you can get to folic acid however you want. That's somebody who normally can process folic acid. Somebody with the MTHFR genetic mutation, they can't get through that chocolate shell. There's no way for them to get inside to the soft serve ice cream. So what do we do? We give them L-methylfolate, which is a broken down version of folic acid. So basically, it's folic acid without the chocolate shell. And when you have this type of folic acid, it helps you to absorb the benefits of the folic acid altogether. MTHFR mutation is one of the reasons why women will have repeated miscarriage. So this is something that we try to test for. Um, I could go on and on, but one of the things that I wanted to say with this is that the tests are explainable. So if you have a list of tests that they run, ask him to explain all of them to you and make sure that going into another potential pregnancy that you've been medically ruled out for stuff like thyroid issues and diabetes and high blood pressure and autoimmune and the such. Make sure you and your partner have been tested for genetic abnormalities that might be incompatible with life so that you can, you know, be sure that everything's going the way you want it. Sarah, what advice would you give before a glucose test? Um, so honestly, uh, make sure you're fasting like they tell you, okay, and nothing else. Uh, the glucose test is not, people oftentimes think, oh, if I, if I don't eat a lot of sugar the couple of days before, I'll pass the test. It's not really how it works. Um, the glucose tolerance test is testing your body's ability to process sugar by um, using your own insulin, right? pancreas secretes insulin that helps you process sugar. And so that's the whole point of um, your insulin production and stuff. So when you have um, diabetes, what happens is your insulin production is poor, and you can't process that glucose. Therefore, the glucose stays high, therefore you have diabetes. So the thing is, what can you do? Nothing, because if this process has already started, which is the process of diabetes, that started a long time ago. So fast, make sure you're well hydrated, and just go with it. Just go with it. Diabetes is scary. Yes. Diabetes can be managed. Yes. And I encourage women to ask their provider to treat them so it used to be that we tried to do diet, and I just find that diet's ridiculous, okay? If you've been diagnosed with diabetes, you ask them to give you insulin. We do not use pills. Pills are not effective because long-term, pills are good for long-term control, and you're going to be pregnant for such a short amount of time, pills aren't going to work. The reason why we go straight to insulin is we need to get that blood sugar fast. We need to get it normal fast, and insulin does the job. So if I was to become pregnant right now and found out that I had gestational diabetes, I would be asking for, um, I'd be asking for insulin and I'd be doing the keto diet, 100%. Without a shadow of a doubt, that's what I'd be doing. I would ask them not to do just diet alone because I know how important it is to keep the sugar under control. So that's a good question. Um, last one of the night is actually just a comment that I got and I thought it was so important that I decided that I wanted to close with this one. I'm pregnant and actually in the hospital right now with a hemoglobin of seven, and I'm very dizzy having continuous headaches. Also, I have an infection of bacterial and the doctors are refusing to treat me as a high risk pregnancy patient and saying that my hemoglobin has to be six below 
sorry, it has to be below six before transfusions. Okay. So this comment was one of the most co important comments that I think I've ever received um, up to date on a preg on a, on one of my videos. And so this is where I'm closing. So first of all, this deals with advocacy. Um, as patients, we need to advocate for ourselves and our healthcare and making sure that we are safe and our babies are safe. If you don't feel good, you keep asking for help. Why is this comment so important? Because it seems pretty innocuous. Well, this came in on my sickle cell trait video. Okay. Sickle cell disease and sickle cell trait is something that is almost universally um, only in one category of human beings, which is African Americans. Okay. The sickle cell mutation came out of Africa to help treat malaria. When you have a sickle cell mutation, you, um, it, your body can't become infected with malaria, which is endemic in Africa. So it's extremely um, helpful for a lot of Africans, but there are downsides and sickle cell disease can be devastating. It can cause a lot of pain and a lot of other issues. The reason why this comment is so important is this highlights an issue that is happening all over the world. We are finding more and more that women of color are receiving substandard care. So she is referring to being symptomatic with a low hemoglobin. In the hospital, when we would have women who were anemic and symptomatic, symptomatic can be dizziness, can be fatigue, it can be fainting, it can be high heart rate, it can be all these other things. We gave them blood transfusions, even if they weren't under the designated number. That was not something we just looked at exclusively. If you were symptomatic, we treated you because you were at risk for so many other issues, including falls. This mom is being told, even symptomatic and even with a low hemoglobin, that she cannot receive a blood transfusion. She's also being told she's not high risk. I disagree with both of those. We treat all sickle cell patients as a high risk pregnancy, period, end of conversation. So what is happening right here? In my opinion, this is the racial disparity that we see in the healthcare system. This is the exact thing that's happening to black women and other women of color all over the world. They are being treated with a different standard of healthcare. And unfortunately, if I was the same woman, I would not be treated this way and I would receive a blood transfusion. So it's extremely important for you guys to listen to this comment. If you are a woman of color, you need to advocate for yourself. There are plenty of amazing healthcare providers that are out there and they are looking to do the best that they can for you, but there are others that do not. There are plenty of healthcare providers that cannot separate their potential feelings of racism. They cannot separate their prejudices against different things that they are presented with different people of color. And so you need to make sure that you advocate and you have all your friends and family advocate and you make sure that you're telling them if anything bad happens to you, it's because they did not treat you properly. And that's what I wanted to leave, close with tonight because I thought that was a very important comment. My name is Dr. Samantha and I am the maternity mentor. I am here every Monday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to answer your questions live, as well as the questions that you have submitted onto our videos in the comments of our videos. Please continue to comment on videos. And if you ever have any questions or suggestions about videos that you'd like to see in the future, please make sure you put them there. I see all of the comments. I try to answer them myself. Um, we are also on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Please share the channel with your friends and family. Please make sure you like and subscribe. It really, really helps me out and I really appreciate it. You can also hit the notification button to get notified when we put out a new video. We don't have a new video coming out tomorrow, but I have some good ones in the works, including a video on baby aspirin use during pregnancy, as well as the RSV vaccine. I hope you guys all have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm Dr. Samantha, the maternity mentor. Bye for now.